This episode of The Cyberwire is made possible in part by Cyber Reason. They're coming for it. Your personal data, your intellectual property, your business. Cyber attackers are working to take what belongs to you and holding you to ransom. Defenders don't fear ransomware, they end it. With Cyber Reason, defenders detect and stop ransomware that even others miss every time. A promise backed by a $1 million breach warranty. At Cyber Reason, they don't fear ransomware, they end it. Learn more at cyberreason.com slash ransom. Twitch is breached. A newly discovered Iranian threat group is described. A Chinese cyber espionage campaign in India proceeds by phishing. Safe Moon altcoin is trendy fish bait in criminal circles. As the U.S. prepares to convene an anti-ransomware conference, Russian gangs show no signs of slacking off. Betsy Carmelite from Booz Allen Hamilton on artificial intelligence and machine learning in cyber defensive operations. Our guest is Adam Flatley of Redacted with recommendations from the Ransomware Task Force and observations on what counts as compromising material. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Wednesday, October 6, 2021. Twitch, the live streaming service that focuses on serving gamers, has sustained a major data breach. The Video Games Chronicle reports that an anonymous hacker, and that's anonymous with a small a, hosted a 125-gigabyte torrent stream to 4chan this morning that's said to include Twitch's source code and user payout information, in addition to other material that the report says amount to basically everything. What's the motivation for the attack? The anonymous hacker wrote that the dump's intention was to foster more disruption and competition in the online video streaming space because there, that is, Twitch's community, is a disgusting, toxic cesspool. Twitch confirmed that there had indeed been a breach, tweeting, We can confirm a breach has taken place. Our teams are working with urgency to understand the extent of this. We will update the community as soon as additional information is available. Thank you for bearing with us. End quote. The story is developing. We observe that the comment thread below Twitch's tweet is unhelpful. Security firm Cyber Reason has updated its account of Operation Ghost Shell, a cyber espionage campaign the firm's researchers described in July of this year. Among the discoveries they regard as particularly noteworthy are Ghost Shell's association with a hitherto unknown threat group, Malkamak, believed to be operating in the interests of Iran, and Malcomach's deployment of the novel shell client Remote Access Trojan, a rat, as such things are called. Malcomach has been operating since 2018 at least. Some of Malcomach's techniques suggest connections to other Iranian threat groups, notably Shafer APT or APT-39 and Agrius APT, but there were enough differences to warrant identifying it as a new threat group. Mal Kamak abused legitimate cloud services, notably Dropbox, for command and control. It's been evasive and stealthy. Using those cloud services, for example, helped its command and control traffic blend in to the unobjectionable background of the traffic that ordinarily transits those services, which is how it escaped notice for three years. There were also, Cyber Reason says, some code similarities with tools used by Russian threat actors— A Yara rule, for example, seemed to allude to the Russian group known as Turla, but the researchers concluded that, as attractive as it might first appear in a search for clues, low-hanging fruit, Cyber Reason called it, this amounted to an incidental and wasn't grounds for any attribution to any Russian group. Where Malkamak fits into Tehran's org chart isn't clear. Cyber Reason doesn't rule out that they could be a contractor or a mercenary group, Whatever Malkamak may be, Cyber Reason's researchers describe them as both capable and stealthy. 
Their recent campaigns have displayed an interest in the aerospace industry in Europe and North America and a very strong regional interest in the Middle East. BlackBerry's research and intelligence team has linked China's APT-41 to an ongoing campaign against espionage targets in India. The campaign is noteworthy for its use of COVID-19 or income tax-themed fishbait as it prospects its targets. BlackBerry credits earlier research by FireEye, now Mandiant, Positive Technologies and Prevalian with setting them on the right track. APT-41 has gone by many names, including Double Dragon, Barium, Winty, Wicked Panda, Wicked Spider, TG-2633, Bronze Atlas, Red Kelpie, and Blackfly. We really do need a naming committee, don't we? This most recent report includes a set of indicators of compromise. It's unsurprising that a cyber espionage campaign would make use of phishing to gain access to its targets, and it's also unsurprising that it would use topics of current interest as its fish bait. What is noteworthy, BlackBerry says, is the infrastructure employed. Their report says, quote, With the resources of a nation-state-level threat group, it's possible to create a truly staggering level of diversity in a threat infrastructure. And while no one security group has that same level of funding, by pooling our collective brain power, we can still uncover the tracks that the cyber criminals involved worked so hard to hide. End quote. Cyber criminals continue to follow niche fads. ESET describes how the currently shiny reputation of the new and highly volatile SafeMoon altcoin has prompted criminals to use it as fishbait in a campaign designed to get the marks to download the Remcos rat. Remcos itself occupies an increasingly familiar gray area. It has legitimate uses, but it's also widely employed by criminals for stealing credentials from a range of browsers, keylogging, webcam and microphone hijacking, and downloading further malware. ESET concludes with some cautions about the skepticism you should bring to any unsolicited communications. Their summation is worth quoting. When it comes to investing in cryptocurrencies, you need to proceed with caution, and not just because the market is rife with investment fraud, fake giveaways, and other scams. But surely you know the drill by now. End quote. And part of that drill is realizing that fishbait will follow the fads. As the U.S. prepares to organize multinational discussions of ransomware and what to do about it, U.S. officials say they've seen no decrease in ransomware. General Nakasone, director NSA, said at Mandiant's summit yesterday that ransomware is a national security issue and that he expects it to remain such for the foreseeable future. The Hill quotes General Nakasone as saying that he expects the U.S. to come under ransomware attack every single day. Deputy National Security Advisor for Cyber and Emerging Tech Ann Neuberger said, NextGov reports, that the 30-nation meeting the U.S. intends to convene will focus on ways of improving resilience, on increasing visibility through anti-money laundering efforts in particular, on holding nation-states accountable for harboring cyber criminals and on helping to build capabilities in other countries. What about those other nations who harbor cyber criminals? In particular, what about Russia? CISA director Jen Easterly told a Washington Post Live event yesterday that the gang's Russian enablers have shown no signs of backing off, whatever they may have told President Biden when he complained to them during his summit with Russian President Putin. I have not seen any significant material changes. We have seen uh, ransomware gangs uh, that seem to have gone offline for a period of time. Uh, That's not that terribly unusual. We've seen that uh, in the past where infrastructure will come down and then it will reemerge. The ransomware gang will be renamed. Uh, This is a difficult, complicated problem. And I think to your point about Uh, the president's conversation uh, with uh, the Russians, I think this really has to be a whole of government effort. You know, with respect to where CISA is, we are all on what I would call uh, a focus on left of boom. We are in the space of helping build resilience to ensure that 
uh, everybody, businesses large and small, critical infrastructure owners and operators, understand the steps that they need to take so that they are not a victim of ransomware. We, of course, help to respond. Uh, we can assist in recovery, and then we share that information to prevent future victims. That's CISA Director Easterly at The Washington Post Live. A former advisor to former U.S. President Trump, Fiona Hill, no particular admirer of her former boss, had told Congress it was highly unlikely Russia had any compromising material on the ex-president. So, no salacious dirt, apparently. Such psychological ascendancy as President Putin may have achieved was what we might call open source, a sense that his American counterpart would be susceptible to flattery, and there's no compromat necessary for that. Attention to the tabloids in the supermarket checkout aisle could have told the SVR that, and no elaborate espionage, cyber or otherwise, would have been required. Speaking of President Putin and the oligarchs who circulate in Russia's circles of power, where were they in the Pandora Papers, that big leak of information about the use of offshore accounts and shell companies by prominent people around the world? Sure, they were in there, but not nearly as much as one might have expected. An essay in Bloomberg thinks this is a sign that the oligarchs have de-offshored, that the lessons of the earlier Panama Papers leaks have been learned. But there's something there, apparently, or at least the Washington Post thinks so. The Pandora Papers connect a swell luxury apartment in Monaco with one Svetlana Krivanovic, a St. Petersburg native of humble origins, who's believed, the Post says, to have been in a long-term, discreet relationship with Mr. Putin. Quote, Previously undisclosed financial records combined with local tax documents show that Krivanovic, 46, became the owner of the apartment in Monaco through an offshore company created just weeks after she gave birth to a girl. The child was born at a time when, according to a Russian media report last year, she was in a secret years-long relationship with Russian President Vladimir Putin. End quote. Now that's some kind of compromat, and come to think of it, it's probably available in the checkout line. We'll take a look the next time we hit the local supermarket. And now, a word from our sponsor, Recorded Future. Recorded Future will be hosting their incredibly valuable intelligence summit, PREDICT, on October 12th and 13th, 2021. During this virtual event, speakers and sessions will explore how intelligence empowers defenders with the visibility to make faster, smarter, more confident decisions. Join us as we feature thought-provoking keynote speakers such as Sir Alex Younger and Frank Abagnale. And this year, there will be more than 40 breakout sessions that could be counted as CPE credit opportunities. We hope to see you there. Visit recordedfuture.com slash predict to register. Again, that's recordedfuture.com slash predict to register for Predict 2021. And we thank Recorded Future for sponsoring our show. Adam Flatley is former director of operations at NSA and currently director of threat intelligence at cybersecurity company Redacted. Adam also serves on the Ransomware Task Force, a group assembled by some of the top names in the industry. They delivered their 81-page report to the Biden administration in April. I think that the most important recommendation that was made was that ransomware be treated as a national security issue instead of just a criminal issue. And that is what's going to be the real game changer here, because ever since the administration accepted this recommendation and then implemented it, they are now able to pull all kinds of tools off the shelf that were not normally turned against cyber criminals because the priority has raised up it's now on the national security priority, and now they can engage other parts of the government besides uh, normal. normally what you would expect are things like actions from the Treasury and actions from law enforcement. But now they can really reach out into the full capabilities of the government to tackle this problem. So what went into that specific recommendation? How did you and your colleagues 
come up with the notion that ransomware should be considered a national security issue? Well, there was a couple of things. Um, the, the problem has been growing exponentially over the past year and a half to two years. And we've started to see that this indiscriminate targeting is starting to have real world impact. So it's not just loss of money, but they're hitting hospitals in the middle of the pandemic shutting down systems that are, you know, life-saving systems. They're also going after things like the, f- the food supply, the power supply, all kinds of critical infrastructure that they're targeting just without any type of morality whatsoever. Even the, even the ransomware groups that claim that they don't do it, we see them totally continue to go after these, these critical things. So, these operations aren't just about, you know, the U.S. losing money anymore. It's about actually causing threat to life in some cases and causing, you know, real problems for our national security. As you saw with the Colonial Pipeline, that was shut down for a relatively short amount of time. And you saw how much panic buying there was and, and how much that the, you know, the whole eastern seaboard was, was kind of shaken by that event. So now that the government has adopted that particular recommendation that it be treated as a national security issue, you mentioned that that uh, puts some more tools at their disposal. What sort of things do they have available to themselves now? So some of it is going to be increased priority within the organizations that were already working ransomware. So um, groups like, uh, like CISA, FBI, Secret Service, Treasury, that, you know, they've all been working this problem really hard, but they didn't have all the resources that they needed to really amp it up and go after it. So they're going to be able to get more resources because of the raised priority. And then there are other pieces of the government that just were not engaged in, in cybercrime, which can now be brought to the table. So think about our intelligence agencies and, and other capabilities that can now shift their focus to look at these cybercrime actors when before they weren't even on their target deck. And what's next for the task force itself? I mean, is there, is it continuing? Is, is there more work ahead? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we are providing a lot of um, consultation to um, government and private industry organizations who, who uh, they like the recommendations and they want assistance or to want to understand it a little bit better. Um, so that we're doing a lot of work behind the scenes to sort of help people who want to do the right thing. And is that, you know, the whole range of government in terms of options that are on the table, you know, everything from sanctions through the military itself? Yeah, I mean, every, everything that we do needs to obviously be proportionate and reasonable. Um, but there are a lot of things that can be done that, that used to be off the table. Um, which can now be on the table because of that national security designation. And that can really be the game changer if we have the real will to do it. That's Adam Flatley. He's director of threat intelligence at Redacted and a member of the Ransomware Task Force. It's time to take a moment to tell you about our sponsor, Tanium. From November 16th to 18th, join thousands of global IT and security professionals online for Converge. Three days of engaging keynotes with industry luminaries, curated informative breakout sessions, and technical hands-on lab experiences will help you optimize your cybersecurity readiness, gain new skills, and learn new best practices for overcoming common IT and security challenges. Visit converge.tanium.com to register today. And we thank Tanium for sponsoring our show. And I'm pleased to be joined once again by Betsy Carmelite. She's a senior associate at Booz Allen Hamilton. Betsy, it's always great to have you back. Um, you know, I wanted to touch base with you when it comes to AI and ML in uh, cyber operations, particularly defensive operations. 
You know, I think for a while, uh, we certainly went through a round of having AI and ML being hot buzzwords. And I, it seems to me like we've settled into more of a, a rational place with these technologies, more, more practical than perhaps we were before. Um, what is your take on this? Where do we stand when it comes to cyber defensive operations and AI and ML? Sure. I wanted to really talk about the requirement for augmenting traditional cyber operations with the use of AI and ML. And that's without question very much needed. Just look at the past year of attacks, our attack surface expansion, and our understanding of cyber mission challenges as a result. Obviously, attacks are more sophisticated, targeted, and frequent. Secondly, we're seeing organizations and agencies rely on cyber tools that fail to integrate, and they depend on siloed network data for alerts. Hmm. And this is where we're seeing AI come in to help. And then third, rapid streaming analysis and analytic approaches aren't offered in a vendor agnostic platform. So the end result in defensive cyber operations is delayed analysis and delayed detection. Hmm. Does the AI and and ML serve as a way to sort of um, stitch together various uh, products that people might be using and, and do it in a very automated sort of way? Well, yes, uh, you can use products that are existing. Um, I want to really focus this more on like some of the components and the services and the capabilities that AI and ML can offer, because product integration is something that can come really after you come up with a strategy and, and look at what you need to address. But two components that you can apply to the cybersecurity setting where AI and ML come in And this is especially interesting to me in my career as a threat intelligence analyst, because this really, these are really game changers in in, in helping operations. First, um, we see AI and ML addressing the challenge of real-time adaptability. In security operations, ideally you're seeking immediate analytic insights and not retrospective views or delayed insights. Hmm. With AI systems, data feeds are processed in motion at the edge and across all data sources. So if you think about the volume of data and data sources that are pulled from network and endpoint sensors, logs, the millions of assets in a large organization, you're thinking of terabytes of data. So analyzing that data at the point of ingest before it's funneled into a SIM so that raw data normalization occurs closer to the point where the data is generated is key because you create a common data model earlier. And Mm. that common data model means better data for analysts and faster response time because analysts aren't manually pulling the data together from the SIM. This reduces their their time to be doing that, that heavy lift. This does require, however, security analysts, business strategists, and data scientists all talking together so that there's an understanding of how data needs to be used in that security use case. Um, And then the second second way AI can be used in this this operations model is to enrich data analysis also at the point of ingest. Uh, The common data model that I just mentioned brings multiple data feeds together. So in the enrichment process, the event data that's coming from sensors and logs, so like right off of your network, is fused with non-event data. So maybe that's threat intelligence or vulnerability data. Mm-hmm. And that brings meaning to a current circumstance for the operations team. With the AI-driven integration of this data at the edge prior to SIM filtering, analysts are given the time to complete more complex tasks around the analysis and how you, how they need to respond. So as opposed to the time con- consuming data fusion across multiple feeds, dashboards, and reports. You know, that's fascinating. The, the whole notion of, of having um, the AI be out on the edge, I mean, it kind of reminds me of, uh, you know, your, your, the, the human nervous system. You know, if you touch a hot stove, your, your hand gets yanked away before your brain really knows what's happening, right? You know, you're, your nervous system says there's danger here. We need to make an adjustment. And only later do you look and see, oh, I was touching a hot stove. I mean, it seems like a similarly uh, effective protective use case here. Yeah. And basically, um, like to your to your hot stove 
you're, you're detecting that hot stove a lot earlier. Um, you're, de- you're detecting things that you weren't able to detect previously. So one example to, to really illustrate this that comes to mind is how AI and ML could possibly have helped detect detection in the detection of the sunburst malware used in the SolarWinds mm. Orion software supply chain attacks. The use of AI in the detection of patterns, specifically how sunbursts use the domain generation algorithm, uh, also known as the DGA, to generate and change the command and control channels, could have determined the anomalies of the malware's behavior. And to be clear, we're not talking about pinpointing whether the activity is malicious, but rapidly identifying the DGA behavior patterns that would help an analyst and reduce that analyst's reliance on multiple tools, multiple data sources, and identify those previous and expected behaviors earlier. And, yeah. and also reduce false positive, um, false positives in those detections. Right. So the AI can come to the human analyst and say, hey, there's something here that I think may deserve your attention. Yes, yeah. And this actually improves the, the workforce experience and is one of the benefits of AI integration in cybersecurity. We often recommend that um, cyber operators and analysts really look at how, um, how their SOPs and their manual activities are, are impacting their work. Um, like I spend a lot of time with my analyst team looking at the attack surface of organizations and AI-enabled data and enrichment processes could really reduce that cumbersome correlation time of data inputs when you really need to be getting the core threat analysis and threat modeling out there. There are other increased cost savings because of the improved response time and activities for preventing breaches and malicious attacks. It also leads to improved brand reputation for an organization and increased consumer trust, um, knowing that the organization has you know, improved security protocols. So it, it, there's a lot of education that probably needs to be done for an organization to look into applying AI to their security operations, learning about the breadth of AI use cases for cybersecurity for both government and commercial missions. And again, knowing, your, knowing the challenges of the workforce in, in executing their cyber missions as practitioners. AI, in this case, can very much augment security operations, uh, the defensive posture that, that organizations take to stay out of attacks and produce better results. All right. Well, interesting insights for sure. Betsy Carmelite, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Dave. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, SpyCloud, the leader in account takeover and fraud prevention. Learn more at spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And that's the CyberWire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Elliot Peltzman, Trey Hester, Brandon Karp, Peru Prakash, Justin Sabi, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. And now a word from our sponsor, ExtraHop. Stopping advanced threats with network detection and response. Let's face it, cyber attackers have the advantage. ExtraHop is on a mission to help you take it back. Regain the upper hand with security that can't be undermined, outsmarted, or compromised. With complete visibility from ExtraHop, enterprises can detect malicious behavior, hunt advanced threats, and forensically investigate any incident with confidence. When you don't have to choose between protecting your business and moving it forward, that's security uncompromised. 
See how it works in the full product demo, free online at extrahop.com slash cyber. That's extrahop.com slash cyber. And we thank ExtraHop for sponsoring our show.